this is Channel 9, Fairfield Public Access Television. I'm Susan Kessel, Station Manager. Connie Boyer and I are doing another of our opening Fairfield Doors show. Um, we have a special guest today. First, I'm going to say who's sponsoring our show. Patrick Kessel, Farm Bureau Insurance, is our sponsor for today's show. Thank you, Patrick, for doing this. Um, sorry about last time. <laughs> <laughs> Our guest today is Barry Ross, and um, our show is to discover interesting and talented people, places, things in our community. Usually you read our mission statement, but that'll cover it, I think, for okay. today. So our mission statement is by opening the doors uh, into the lives of the people and places in Fairfield, we hope to promote awareness, understanding, and appreciation of one another. And uh, today I think we're going to do that. It's going to be a really fun hour, and uh, let's get started. Well, I was opening this book, this magazine, and since I started golfing a couple years ago, my dad passed this golf magazine on to me and my husband, and I've always liked the illustration since I'm an artist, but here he is, <laughs> the artist Hello. himself, <laughs> is our guest who lives in Fairfield. Let's hold it open a little bit longer. Well, um, you should really... Uh, next page? It, just, it goes on and on. <laughs> right here in Fairfield, producing a work for this magazine in addition to other magazines, and we didn't even know about it. So now you know, and we're going to learn a lot more. So can you tell us, this is golf? magazine. Can you tell us a little bit about this particular magazine that you work for? Well, it's probably the most prestigious of the golf magazines that are, that are out there. Um, its nearest competitor would, would be Golf Digest. They, of course, would say that they are the most prestigious magazine. But Golf Magazine is probably the oldest and one of the most read and best read uh, magazines around uh, on golf. Um, they're located in New York City. And um, one of the joys of being a, a freelance illustrator is that I can essentially live anywhere, such as you know, living here in Fairfield, and continue to work for uh, New York-based magazines or California-based magazines or um, industrial clients or corporate clients just about anywhere uh, because of the fax machine and FedEx. And uh, for many illustrators today um, who are, I wouldn't quite call it cutting edge, but um, uh, the computer has certainly become a main uh, tool for illustration and of course uh, anyone with a computer can work anywhere as well and actually just um, uh, download their material directly to the magazines which is happening more and more. Um, I'm a bit more of the uh, old-fashioned kind of illustrator in that I like working with uh, uh, pen and ink. I want my hand to be there, the feeling of drawing. Mm -hmm. um, so essentially I work with pen and ink and watercolor and um, Richard, if you could take a little, a little, uh, I don't know if you can see behind us, and this is where he does his work. He's got a little easel here, and you can't big, see it, but, big but behind easel. here, <laughs> okay, yeah, a big easel. But behind here, he's got all his bottles, I guess, of ink, well, correct? Well, um, this would be, is what's called in French a tabaret. Um, and these file drawers contain all of my paper and materials. I have an easel if I want to work something very large. Um, there's a slide projector, uh, lots of storage. Um, this box-shaped, uh, like, almost like a little room, is also a projector. It's an overhead projector, which um, uh, allows me to take um, oh, any kind of, of uh, material uh, from a magazine, for example. And if I wanted to project it onto the table in there, I can actually just project it down, so it's enlarge it, or reduce type. it. Um, it's not a light box, it's actually it, it's a projector. And um, it's one of the cheating ways that uh, professional artists work in terms of um, saving themselves time. Time. Right. Um, makes sense to me. How long have you done this for Golf Magazine? I've been working for the magazine about 25 years. Wow. Uh, yeah. That's a long time. That's a long time. In fact, there is no one at the magazine presently that was there when I started working for them. Um, which is kind of, I get a kick out of that. And, uh, yes. and in wow. fact, the editor-in-chief, uh, I remember when he came in as 
one of the really low down the totem pole writers and began working his way up. So I, I, you know, all the people that I work with there, uh, I've known since they've gotten their jobs. Um, this is true of, of Flying Magazine as well. I've worked for them for about 25 years. Wow. And there is one person at Flying Magazine who was their senior writer who was there at the time that I started working for them. Um, and the, the way it all evolved, um, when one comes out of school as an illustrator, um, you are you are nothing. I was going to say, did you get these jobs right out of college? Oh, no. 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 This took a little bit of, uh, um, uh, what would you call it, marketing. Um, there, was, there was and still is enormous competition in this field. And, um, uh, you know, you come out of school, you don't know anything. You don't know really how to be really professional. You don't know how to sell yourself. And uh, generally, your portfolio doesn't reflect your market. And so there was a whole waiting period of four or five years while I learned what my market was or what I was going to be doing and uh, changed my portfolio. And I realized I love sports. I love playing golf. I, I, I was I'm gonna a, ask yeah, that. I love playing golf. I was a golfer in high school. Um, I'm a pilot, hence the flying magazine stuff. Um, and so I, I said, well, if I wanna do illustrations, then golf would be you know, one of the things I'd like to do. And so I actually prepared some samples of golf drawings and went up to the magazine and saw the art director, who was very courteous and said, well, uh, I'll keep you in mind. And, um, and then I was persistent. I called him probably every other month, and I sent him another new sample or a copy of a sample. And then finally one day he, um, uh, he called me up and said, well, I have this little drawing for you to do. You know? And I was ecstatic. He was like, wow, hey, hey. Now, know? where were you when? I was living in New York City, in New York. which is where I grew up. Um, I'll, I'll go back to that. But at any rate, uh, it was the same with Flying Magazine. I prepared a flying sample. I went to see the art director. It, in both cases, it took about three or four months before I actually got uh, an illustration to do. And it was the most minimal kind of illustration to begin with, but I was happy to get it. And in uh, both cases, it just kept building over time. And at some point, um, when they felt comfortable enough with me that I would interpret the material well, that uh, the readership responded to it well, um, they decided to try a whole new um, series called Private Lessons. It had never been done before, where each drawing was specifically tailored to the needs of a beginner or, you know, um, oh, I guess that was the same one. I'm sorry. To each different level, including the, the, uh, the absolute, you know, um, low handicap or par shooter. Mm -hmm. um, and so I started doing the drawings. I did, and it was on a one year contract. Uh, this there was. There uh, are a lot of drawings in there. Yeah, yeah. Here we go. Here you go. I'm sorry. So it, in each case, it's designated each spread, each, um, this whole spread is for the low handicapper and one would be for the senior player, one would be for the power hitter, uh, one would be for the straight hitter, uh, someone who just gets the ball going along. Um, it turned out um, much, I wouldn't say to their surprise, and much to my, oh, this is Charlie Marinas. That, I don't know if, um, Charlie lives here in Fairfield. So and you're using local models for these. Yeah, I, I get a really, I, I need models for the drawings. Um, I do have a, all these, file draws here are filled with reference material for golf and flying and almost any subject. Mm -hmm. And I have an extensive golf um, uh, reference file. But it's more fun to you know, um, uh, call up a friend who's a golfer and say, uh, hey, you want to pose? And you'll be in a magazine that 13 million people read. We can pose for <laughs> improper <laughs> form, couldn't we, Susan? I do that, <laughs> too. And it's, um, <laughs> I bet you we be, I we bet, had a fun golfing experience this summer. <laughs> I bet you'd be, you know, I've used my wife Katie, who doesn't play golf at all, mm -hmm. for putting, because it doesn't take much to stand there with a putter. Um, essential, uh, one of the essential parts for this, for the magazine, was that I, I truly understood golf. And having been a, a varsity golfer and, and always playing, I did understand the game pretty much completely, which would mean that I would never make a mistake in a drawing, even though they will very carefully check everything that I do and I submit sketches and so on. Um, at any rate, after one year, the readership response was the highest that they had ever gotten on any series. And so they said, well, let's try it for another year. 
Well, now it's 15 years later. And it's still getting the same readership response now. Thank God there's a turnover in, <laughs> in uh, new readers. New golfers. Yeah, new golfers. Um, and every May, May they, they have the results of a survey in which they, the subscribers and the readership will say, well, what do they look at first in the magazine? And uh, I'm proud to say that 80% uh, will look at private lessons first. Then they oh, go to the rest great. of the magazine. Mm -hmm. So as long as I keep getting these numbers, I can, I can go into the there. grave doing these, you know. <laughs> now um, that, like I said, that's a lot of pictures. Do you do those every month? This is every a month, month I do eight magazine? pages, yeah. And probably the hardest part is to keep the freshness, you know, to get, to not redraw the material, because all the material is basically the same. Mm -hmm. There are, isn't a lot of new things in the golf swing. There are some variations and so on. So I will try and get different angles of the same stroke or, uh, to make it as interesting as possible and keep the drawings lively and, and exciting and, mm -hmm. and so on. Um, so it's... it's uh, let's, well, let's talk about a couple of these other magazines that okay. you do. This is called Flying. And Can you, here we have this illustration that Barry's done. So it's down here. That? I don't know if you can actually get close in or not. Uh, this is a, a monthly column in the magazine called I Learned About Flying from That and uh, the readers send in stories of near mishaps or, or any experience in which they learn something about flying and live to tell the tale. Um, and so, oh, again, about 15, maybe 18 years ago, um, this column was already in existence. The fellow who was doing it, um, oh, I guess he, he had, uh, had retired. And they, they approached me and asked me to do it. And um, it's been a ball because I, um, I might also add that um, I also will use the people who actually write the articles. Okay. So I will contact them, and um, they love it, and so do I. And so, so you're given the story right. to develop the... They'll uh, send me a manuscript, same as golf. Uh, in Golf Magazine, they will... Um, Tell you okay. what they want for that they will. Month. They will fax me, this is what it looks like, the actual story. Mm -hmm. You know, this is... Um, uh, yeah, this is uh, Use a Tour Player's Swing. So I will read this. Then I call up the editor that I work with, uh, who is a semi-professional golfer and a writer. And, and uh, they're all, you know, everyone at the magazine are, are uh, were either professional golfers or um, college varsity golfers and so on. And we'll discuss, well, what am I going to show? You know, and then I'll do these little sketches here just for myself, pretty mm -hmm. much. Uh, then I will go to my reference file, or I'll call up uh, a friend like Charlie Marinas, or um, I don't know, uh, there's so many in town that I've used. <laughs> John Wright you used. John That's Wright. I found out about you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Nick Johnson, or, or Joel Leskowitz, or uh -huh. you know. I think I've done about 40 or 50 so far of the of people in, in Fairfield. Um, and then I'll, uh, let's see if I have it here, yeah. Then I'll do sketches, which I hadn't shown you. So these would be like the typical um, sketch, the same size as it'll appear in the magazine, <clears throat> of what the manuscript of what the manuscript had to say. Uh, then I will fax this to the editor. So there are, you know, whole bunches, you know, whole bunches of sketches here. They're double page. Uh, so this would be a double page spread. Mm -hmm. So I'll fax this to the editor. He will look at it and say. Um, I guess nine times, uh, most of the time, there are no changes in the pictures. I also write the captions. Oh, okay. And so the, most often there are changes in the captions because I'm not a writer. But, okay. uh, um, and then after that, I actually do the drawing. So uh, actually, I have, I have this particular one here. Uh, it's going out on Monday. So here is my sketch. Um, I also like to use different, um, have diverse models. So I used a, a Japanese man as the... Mm -hmm. Uh, the prime person here, even though these are two of the uh, professional tour players. Um, and then I feel that thing hanging down in the back. Uh, oh, the microphone. Yeah. And then this is the actual drawing. Which is pen this and is ink. This is pen and ink. And a wash. And wash, black wash. 
Um, what does that mean for those of a, us that aren't artists? A watered down. It's it's like watercolor, but with only one color. It's uh, black, and uh, you water it down to get the grays and and so on. Um, That's beautiful. Well, thank you. Uh, so this is the the drawing for the opening page. Now it's it's a two color job. It's a two color illustration. The magazine uses a second color, a green. Um, however, I'm in order to do it for reproduction. Uh, I do an overlay of the second color in black. So there is the overlay. So, so that would be green. That'll be green, but on this other sheet I will specify in writing that they should take this one and make it 10% of the color, whereas this one would be 100% of the color. Mm -hmm. And that's how we get the variation in color uh, in the drawings in the magazine. Mm -hmm. Then this will be sent to them, it will go out FedEx and uh, they will run it through their scanners and then to the printer and that's how it gets in the magazine. Great. So, so you also do Scientific American, right? Uh, let's see, am I hanging down? Yeah, can we fix yeah. that? We Time out. Uh, adjust a microphone. Here. We're going to adjust the here. microphone here. <laughs> but you do Scientific yes. American also. I do Scientific American as well. Okay. Um, in fact, I do a lot of technology. I, sh I should explain that um, uh, it's, an it's, it's kind of an interesting story as an illustrator. I started out as a sports illustrator, um, and at the time that I was really into that, you know, I, once I started doing golf, I, I was doing flying, and then I said, well, gee, I really like sports, and so I started doing samples of football players, baseball players, um, hunters, and so on. Nice. Now, we're talking about 25 years ago, and I, again, I went to those magazines. Now, I could have done it from out of New York City. You didn't have to do it, although at that time you didn't have FedEx, and you pretty much had to be where the market was, and all the magazines were there. Um, and the same process of you know, persistence paid off uh, in that I started working for Outdoor Life. Um, uh, my biggest client was Sports Illustrated, and I worked for them for about 10 years. and. Um, I would do all of the, uh, for every special event, the Super Bowl, there would be an insert you could pull out that had advertisement in it, but explained about the Super Bowl, mm -hmm. or it explained about the World Series, or whatever it was, the Olympics. And so five or six times a year, I'd have this whole centerfold in the magazine. Um, then when the art director retired, the new art director decided he didn't want to continue the series, and that was the end of the, uh, my association with the magazine. And that happens a lot. I mean, uh, so have you always been a freelance yes. illustrator? Yeah. Wow. Um, now, when I was growing up and looking through magazines and different things, <clears throat> I always was drawn to these hand illustrations, the artwork, <clears throat> and I think they played a pretty big part in influencing my artistic direction and, I guess, the technical, everything technical about it correct and just the precision drawing and. I just love looking at those. So I'm sure there are a lot of kids out there looking at those that will grow up to Today, um, I suppose there are, though uh, illustration has changed in, in, the, in these 25 years, and the computer's taken over a lot, uh, not mm -hmm. entirely. Um, well, yeah, I guess it's, it's, I, I'm still inspired when I look at illustration. I mean, uh, there's just enormous talent out there, um, and every year, I. Uh, I've been a member of the Society of Illustrators all these years, and um, I used to always go, you know, when I was in New York, or even from here, go back and see their show, and I would always walk away feeling um, in awe at the amount of talent, you know, wonderful, wonderful talent. Um, the market has shrunk a bit, so there isn't as much illustration. You don't see that many magazines that have illustration anymore. Uh, what, what do you suggest for young people today? I mean, you said, you know, they don't teach you do they not teach marketing for these kids uh, in they, school Unfortunately, today? I mean, it's what not. Are the, what are the things they should know when they get out in order to go get work? Uh, there's a, well. And find the area that, you know, like you did, find the area that you like to First you have to, to understand what it is you like to draw mm -hmm. and how you draw it and be comfortable with that. Then you need a portfolio that reflects that. Mm -hmm. It has to really um, show your best work and in a, in a kind of narrow market, unfortunately. If you want to do children's books, then everything should be geared for children's books. If you want to do technology, it would be that. Or sports, it would be that. Uh, if you're a people illustrator, it would be that. Now, you said you went to an illustration school? Yeah, 
Um, Are there still very oh, many of those? Oh, they're wonderful. Okay. Uh, what, would you, what one calls a conservatory school, uh, as opposed to a university where you have an art department where you might learn art is just part of it. Mm -hmm. uh, so that would include, um, you know, Pratt Institute, which is where I went in New York City, or Cooper Union, or um, the School of Visual Arts, uh, Parsons. These are all schools that are in New York City. Um, Kansas City has a wonderful, really wonderful art school that teaches illustration. St. Louis has one. Kansas City is probably a little bit better. But all the major cities today have conservatory schools. Um, they're turning out 5,000 illustrators a year. Um, That's a lot. Yes, and there's only so much work. So uh, a lot of things, today you can get, if you're conversant and good on the computer in terms of doing illustration, you'll get work because that's where everything is going. Uh, however, um, you still have to have the basics. You still have to know how to draw, mm -hmm. how to design, uh, and that you don't learn on the computer. You learn that by drawing. You know? And, and um, uh, most people who are really good uh, on the computer started out off the computer. Mm -hmm. um, and all the schools will give you basic courses that, uh, um, where you learn anatomy and design, two-dimensional design, three-dimensional design. Uh, and then at some point, you learn about the computer skills. Uh, it's just another tool. Um, I just feel like uh, you know, an old dog. You know, I'm not out to learn new tricks, and I still <laughs> love what I do. And there's a market for what I do because, uh, I'll, for example, in technology, um, there are lots of people who do computer drawings uh, or drawings with a the computer. They all tend to look the same. And I do technology in a very loose style, um, which I think is quite refreshing, given that everything kind of looks stiff. And so a magazine like Scientific American will use me when they want something that, doesn't, that is technical but doesn't uh, need to look technical. So in this one, yeah, I think this is this. the... Um, this is uh, the February 1998 issue of Scientific American. And for all you Norwegian people, you'll want to read this article <laughs> and see this illustration. It's about the Vikings. It's about the Viking longship. And uh, it has some technology in it. I mean, I had to do this from uh, almost no reference. Uh, a lot of the work I do in technology, they, I'll get blueprints or I'll get... Um, uh, I won't have a photograph. I might have a model, a photograph of a model or something. But it was, it was kind of fun. This is like a really... Um, what I would consider, right, let's say before, what they asked me to draw was a Viking attack group landing on some shore and all of them jumping out of the ship, raising their swords. Do and, you ever you know, get told something and you go, oh, <laughs> how did they expect me to do that? It's never happened. It's just always been, it's, it's always been fun. Yeah, you know. It's fun to find um, a way. You know, so this was interesting in that, um, you know, I went to the library, I went to my reference file, I got all kinds of books on Viking costumes and, you know, so everything is accurate. And one of the things that happens with illustration, um, particularly for a technical magazine or anything that has technology in it, it absolutely must be accurate. When I do a flying illustration and I show a particular airplane, it has to be that plane, that model. If something's happening with the plane, it has to be correct. Mm -hmm. um, if I'm showing the Vikings, even the shields have to be what the shields look like. Because um, if they're not, somebody's going to tell you they're not, you right? You can't make yeah. it up. No. I know when I'm asked to draw certain things, and they'll say, oh, this, 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 and I, you so, can't make it up. So these are all, this is the development of the, of the, uh, the Scandinavian ships, or so boats, as it evolved into the longboat. And these are all the different models. And this is a cross-section of how they structured it, which was different than anyone else did and that it gave enormous flexibility within the hull of the ship as, as a long shape. It, w it could twist and torque and withstand heavy seas. And yet it was so long and narrow and the same at both ends that they could go up a narrow river, attack the settlement, and not have to turn around with this long <laughs> ship which was wider than the river. They would just get back in and go the turn other around. way with the same, you know, using the other bow. It had two bows. As, and uh, and uh, it was quite unique. Um, so that was fun. I, I, uh, I transitioned out of sports other than for golf, um, oh, probably 15 or more years ago, uh, through a friend of mine that was a graphic designer who was doing an annual report for a major corporation. 
Um, and they wanted to do a series of drawings that showed what was happening in the laboratory of that, co of that corporation, the research and so on. I'd never done that, and this was an instance where uh, I had no samples. Um, I wasn't a technician. I wasn't an engineer. But based on his uh, say-so and his clout, so to speak, he was a pretty eminent designer, they said, well, if you say use him, we'll use him. But it better be good, <laughs> you know. And, um, and so they sent me to the various laboratories around the United States, and I interviewed people and took photographs. And um, it was quite exciting. I, I got a real kick out of learning what was going on. And then I did these series of drawings. And um, uh, it was in the annual report. They were real happy with it. And the Art Directors Club of New York voted it a prize that year. Um, well, that's like just coming in at the top. You didn't have to work your way up. And Mobile Oil called me up and they said, gee, we, we saw this thing you did for combustion engineering. Uh, how would you like to do it for us? Oh, sure. Why not? You know? And I was going to say, do you get references from people who see your work in a magazine yeah. or that particular but thing? But I, I, mean, I also started to market more aggressively. And um, uh, so I, I took the combustion engineering annual report, and they had 1,200 copies left over. And I sent them to uh, the Fortune 1000, to the marketing director of, of those corporations. <laughs> and out of that got six assignments to do annual reports you know, the drawings for them. Mm -hmm. uh, I also got to um, uh, Martin Marietta Aerospace, and they were really enamored of the style, which has a slightly Leonardo da Vinci look to it. Mm -hmm. And then I became their signature illustrator. I did all of their ads for 10 years. Um, and that was fun, because they had facilities all around the United States. And once a year, the agency um, uh, account executive and myself and the PR director would travel to each of these facilities. And so it was nice. They were, you know, one was in Denver, so I could go to Vail first, and then and we would do it as a whole week. You know, so it would be the and it was always the same: uh, Denver, New Orleans, um, Orlando, and uh, Washington D.C., and then back home. And, uh, and that went on for a long time. It was it was quite a um, powerful experience because I was seeing the absolute cutting edge of everything done in aerospace. Uh, there is a painting right behind you, if you'll turn around, which looks like a um, mandala, like a, um, a wheel. I don't know if you can focus on that. This one here. Mm -hmm. It's right here, whether it has, gets reflection or not. But that was one of the Martin Marietta projects that I did that wasn't in the Leonardo da Vinci style. And what that circle is, uh, this was for the space shuttle, uh, the space shuttle external tank. Above it, you'll see the, the shape of the nose of that external tank. And this unit right there in the center um, was the, the mechanism. It's 30 feet high. And what it is is an expanding circle. It expands to hold the skin while it's being welded together. There are two of those, and they have this automatic welding system. And, and so the, the upper part of it shows what it looks like, the upper part of the circle. The lower part, if you look at it, actually shows all the hydraulics and how it functions. But as a painting, it becomes an aesthetic painting. It could be mm -hmm. I was gonna standing say, all by as itself. As an artist, it's not just an illustration. It's a beautiful piece mm -hmm. of artwork. Well, thank you. you know, it, um, uh, it's quite fascinating. Uh, well, if you didn't know what it is, it's a beautiful piece. Well, thank you. Uh, it was fun to do, and I love the idea of taking what, what I brought to technology, which a lot of illustrators or painters didn't, was the idea of taking something that is mundane, that is really an everyday, um, almost everything in technology is, is gray. You know, uh, it doesn't have color. It's, it's machines. It's, you know, and I would put these crazy colors in there. You know, I would do, um, I don't know if you, can, if you can go on the wall where the jet engine is. Can you, can you reach that? There's four posters there. Those were done for, um, Oh, I forget which corporation, um, Allied, uh, Allied Corporation, which has uh, owns um, oh, uh, air conditioning company and uh, it owns uh, Sikorsky and it owns uh, Otis Elevator and it owns uh, um, uh, I think it's United Technology rather. So if you look at the way that those drawings are done, that jet engine is an exact perfect drawing of that jet engine, but done in a loose style with all kinds of interesting colors in it. 
or the air conditioner it has all kinds of crazy colors in it. So it becomes a bright and um, aesthetically appealing visual and will attract the reader to look at it as opposed to a real technical drawing which pretty much drives you the other way. Right. I think that's why I enjoyed so much looking at things growing up, these yeah. illustrations, is it was just amazing to me how they, how you turn something into something so attractive. And it well, brings a little more life to it than, yeah. than just, just the a black lines, and white drawing. Just the lines, the way you draw your lines, everything. Well, thank you. I mean, it, it's, I, I try to bring something exciting to the drawing, even if the subject isn't. I remember when I was first starting out, and, and um, we all have mentors, you know, and, and I had an illustrator um, who I worked under. You know, I had space in the studio. I was a freelancer, but he was like there, and he was like the mature illustrator. And um, I learned a lot from him. And he would always say that, that bad illustration never came into the studio. It might, you know, it might leave, but it never came in. You just get your assignment, and you make everything good. You make everything perfect. You bring whatever it needs to be something special. And I always try and keep that in mind. Um, so the, my work became really popular. And, and in the 80s, I was um, actually working too hard and, and traveling a lot, and, and I had assignments in Europe. It was really quite a, uh, um, an exciting time. You know. Um, traveling for Martin Marietta, traveling for um, Exxon. Uh, you know, and, uh, Mobile sent me to the North Sea for three weeks um, in uh, Norway. Mm -hmm. uh, I was uh, three weeks in Norway, which was wonderful. I had a good time. Went skiing, you know, did all kinds of things beside the work. Um, do, you, do you ever find the pressure of having to have this done at a certain time? Does that ever get to you? Um, yeah. Yeah, it's it's uh, I mean, like every it's assignment. Midnight and you have three things that need to be done by tomorrow, or uh, it never gets to that point. You don't let it. I don't let it. I'm very businesslike. I mean, so um, uh, this golf drawing goes out Monday. Uh, it's finished today. I'm not going to, you know. Right. Um, there are times when when I overbook, and I'll take on too much work, and yes, I'll work hard. In fact, what, at one point when I was doing all the technical work. Um, I, I overbooked completely and ended up working 12, 14, 16 hours a day for about a month and a half, two months. And uh, then the whole family, we, we were going skiing in Europe. And I remember I slept for two weeks after that while everyone <laughs> skied. I mean, I simply couldn't. And I realized that no matter how much money was involved, it wasn't worth it. Right. And as a matter of fact, since coming to Fairfield, I've been consciously, uh, I've been here now for four years, and I've actually stopped marketing myself in terms of the technology. Um, I really want to spend time um, sculpting. You know. So you're crossing over that line to the strictly art. Yeah. I think over the next few years, um, golf magazine willing. Uh, I, you know, I, I'll keep, I would like to keep the magazine you know, contracts going and um, and allow myself at least a couple of weeks a month that I will sculpt and just devote myself to that. And hopefully at some point uh, the sculpture will start selling or, you know, mm -hmm. we'll see. In any event, it will be a lot more fun than just working, 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 working. And I've done that. You know, I've right. done the, um, you know, I've done about as much as one can uh, do in terms of illustrating technology and, you know, have been successful at it. and. Uh, I could continue to do it and continue, you know, but it's it's starting to get boring, even no matter what colors I use, you know. Um, right. So uh, let's, let's take yeah. a little break and tell people who we're talking to and go back to the childhood and then come back up. Okay. So we're talking with Barry Ross here in Fairfield. He's an illustrator, professional illustrator. He has an office here on the square, and he's talking about his work. And this picture is a picture of him when you were 10, did you say? 10 years old, yeah. 10 after uh, he's got a painting right here. I don't know how well uh, you come through on the camera. Or the Turn glare. it this way. Sometimes the glare. Uh, but at 10, it's obvious that he knows that he's an artist. It's incredible had, to me because you had some uh, real paint brushes and a real easel. And, and it was real oil paints. And real oil paints. <laughs> and I know when I was five, I saw someone with an easel. And that's when I decided I wanted to be an uh. artist. Um, so you do know. Yeah. You know. So and you knew uh, before you were 10, obviously. Yeah, I was about seven when I really started, you know, loving drawing. 
and uh, my dad noticed, and he was an artist also. I mean, he, uh, he never really, he became more of a businessman. He had an advertising agency in New York City, and, and in fact, that was taken, the photograph was taken uh, at his office, you know, in the studio. Um, but, um, so he would bring home art materials and, and books. And, oh, how exciting. Uh, it was fun, you know, it was like, um, so I always had plenty of stuff, and, and, uh, um, and I realized, you know, this is what I wanted to do. And I, I didn't want to necessarily be a fine artist, meaning, you know, paint for painting's sake. I liked mm -hmm. drawings that told stories. And um, so I, I, uh, I was born and raised in New York City, in the Bronx, um, amid nothing but bricks. <laughs> um, and uh, after I finished junior high school, uh, New York City has uh, some wonderful schools uh, that are... Um, special in terms of uh, how they teach their students and where their emphasis lies. So they have the Bronx High School of Science, uh, they have Stuyvesant, these are the technical schools, um, uh, Brooklyn Poly, which is a technical school, um, the High School of Performing Arts, which was the school from fame, um, and they had the high school, and still do, uh, the High School of Music and Art, where um, students that were talented in art or music would take a test and go to that school. And um, half the school were musicians, half the school were artists. Wow, that's and great. <laughs> it was really unique. And, and the kids came from all the five boroughs. It was uh, located in uh, Upper Manhattan. And uh, you had academics all morning, and you had painting all afternoon, or sculpture, or ceramics, or, you know, it was just everything involved in art all afternoon. Um, sometimes it was reversed. You had it in the morning, in, the af in you know, class in the afternoon. And the musicians had just the opposite. They had, you know, they had uh, musical, whatever it was, mm -hmm. music in the, but also the artists and the musicians had to take history of art, history of music together, and uh, music and art appreciation and so on. It was uh, quite a unique place. And the kids who went there were um, just a stunning array of, of talented and, and uh, interesting, precocious people. I mean, I'm sure you know some that went on to, uh, you can say, I knew them when. Well, it's true. Uh, um, in my class, uh, P.D. Arrow from Peter, Paul, and Mary was in my class. Um, Billy D. Williams, who's the, the, mm -hmm. uh, the, um, mm -hmm. the actor, uh, was in my class. Um, there are people who sang for the Metropolitan Opera, um, some pretty well-known writers and, and um, pr producers, uh, Hollywood producers. Um, and out of the, you know, just the whole group, uh, you know, people who went to that school, um, all kinds of, you know, um, all famous uh, people who write music for the movies or... or uh, and I'm sure there's some saying, and I, I knew Barry oh, Ross. Oh, I don't know about <laughs> that. <laughs> Her illustrates for a... Golf. Only if they open Golf Magazine, I suppose. But um, uh, it's always fun to, you know, we have reunions and, and, you know, go back and see where everybody is. And, you know, Peter will show up and he'll play, he'll sing for everybody and... and uh, I can remember, you know, in class with him, um, and I used to play the guitar and we'd sing together. You know, <laughs> little did I know, you know. Like, right, um, right. So that was a great place, and, and um, it was a lot of fun, and and, uh, um, and it was just, uh, you know, it, the path going where I was going was was uh, very defined, and um, from there I decided to the best illustration course, most professional course at the time was given at Pratt Institute in Brooklyn, so I went there and, and graduated from Pratt. And um, uh, went so out and Did you stay in New York City then until you moved to Fairfield? Uh, no, I, I li well, I lived in New York City, um, oh, until about 10 years ago, and uh, raised a family there and, and uh, lived on the Upper West Side. And um, the kids are like quintessential New York City kids, but they're not, you know, they, they, uh, neither one of them lives in New York City. Uh, my son is a uh, professional mime who went to the High School of Performing Arts and um, is the lead clown for the South Pacific Company of the Cirque du Soleil. And he travels oh, I around. I want to go see that. Yeah. He's, he's fabulous. He's a wonderful, extraordinary performer. My daughter still lives in, in the New York area and um, she uh, works in an interior design office and manages it and, um, you know, it's a painter and, you yeah. know. As an artist, uh, yeah, artist they followed well. in his footsteps, being right, but, uh, right. in art-related fields. Some yeah, pretty way, much. Um, 
No, I finally at some point couldn't handle New York City. I just, you know, um, it was too adversarial. It was just too difficult for me. And uh, I loved it, but it was like burnout, you know. And so um, my wife and I moved to um, Northampton, Massachusetts, up in the Berkshires. And we lived there for about 10 years. And she had lived here for about eight years in the 80s. And she didn't like Northampton. Northampton was very interesting. There were 34 illustrators in that town. 34. Um, 32 of them were book illustrators. Some of the best in the country, some of the really best known book illustrators lived there. Um, there were only three of us, two or three of us that were, you know, did other kind of illustration. It was a very cultural kind of atmosphere. Um, it still was, felt a little edgy for me. And um, Now, as far as you know, are you the only illustrator in Fairfield? Um, I think there are one or two. There might be, an, be others. There are a couple of others. I don't know what kind of work they do. I haven't been really in touch with them. Um, but uh, it would be interesting to me. You know, there to are see. a lot of artists in Fairfield. Now, I know there are a lot of artists. You know, and, and, but in terms of people who strictly do illustration, who you know, do drawings for books or for mm -hmm. um, uh, magazines or corporations, I don't know if there's anyone else doing that. And there might be. Uh, so you would know probably better than I. I'm not sure on that one. Yeah. I was just going to say, so now you're here in Fairfield, and uh, you're above what used to be Sociables on the north side of the square. And when I popped up here this summer to visit you, to, to discover you <laughs> for myself, I was in awe of your space here. Oh, it's thank just, you. Uh, just what I imagined. Me too. I mean, I could never afford this, nor find it in New York City. I mean, it would be pr so prohibitive uh, in terms of like if you wanted a loft in Soho, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, uh, a space like this in Soho would probably, if you, if you want, you, you couldn't rent it. I mean, the, if you could rent it, it would probably cost you $4,000 a month, you know, and if you wanted to buy it, uh, you would be looking at, at these days, um, four hundred dollars to $500,000, you know, to buy, a, a, you know, a loft like this. So this is so, just great. And, I just love it. And I don't have any garbage cans outside the door, or, you know, or noise at night. And you know, it's like, mm -hmm. uh, no, it's a wonderful space. I'm really happy here. So maybe uh, we can talk about a few more of these yeah, these sure. items that are on the wall behind us of, of this wonderful space and see some of your other work. Yeah. So let's just start behind us. This. Uh, okay. Um, I don't know if you can see it on this camera, but this is like dimensional here. It's a can you mold, can you see this one? It's a sculpture actually, and um, it's in plaster Paris. And then on the sculpture, I actually drew. Um, oh, is that pencil? No, that's pen and ink. Pen and ink. Yeah. Um, I, for a while, I did a lot of pharmaceutical illustration. Uh, these were illustrations done for, let's say, Pfizer, you know, pharmaceutical, or any of the um, the large companies. And there was a period of time for about five or ten years. I did um, just a whole bunch. And this was on asthma. And I had done a whole series of brochures on asthma. These are the tests for asthma. And so I got the idea. This was for an ad. And if you think of this as a magazine, in the center of the, of the two pages right there, uh, all the copy, the type, went above it. Now, this mm -hmm. actual, actual sculpture was for the ad? And they photographed it. OK. All right. So what I did is I did a sculpture of a body, a bar relief, showing the, the chest cavity and the the, the uh, bronchial tube and you know everything that goes into the chest. And then on it, I drew, you know, the X-ray, the bronchial tubes, the the tests that they do, listening, the doctor's prescriptions, and so on. It's faded a bit over time. Um, you talk about deadlines and, and problems. <laughs> well, there's a funny story with this. Um, I had never done this kind of sculpture before, you know. So I I got the plaster and I you know kind of gooped it on there, and I carved it, and so on and so forth. Um, and before I could continue with it, it had to dry. I couldn't draw on it while it was wet, only it wasn't drying. The job was due on a Monday, and this was Friday, and it was still wet. And I hadn't even, and, and, I mean, it was wet, you know? Um, so I call up a friend of mine who's a sculptor, and does, uh, he does props, and he does things for television, and you know, special effects things, and. Uh, um, and I said, uh, Zach, what am I going to do? He says, well, you, you have to get it into something where you can dry it. I said, the thing is 32 inches long. You know? <laughs> he says, I don't know what you're going to do. He says, but you, how about your oven? I said, it'll never fit Air in dryer? there. 
<laughs> no, hair dry wouldn't dryer. do it. It needed like uh, you know, 250 or 300 degrees, 400 degrees for about an hour. So I was despondent. I was thinking the job has to be there on this man's desk on, on uh, Monday. Here it is Friday. I said, well, I'll go out and get lunch, you know. So I went down to Broadway. I lived, I lived right. Eat. Yeah, I, you know, food, emotion. So I went down to Broadway. I, uh, at the time, I was working at home. Um, we had a very, very large apartment on, on uh, a block from Broadway on the Upper West Side. Um, noisy, but it was, it was still home. So I went down to Broadway and I went to a pizza place. And I said, I'm sitting there eating pizza and I'm looking up and I look at his pizza. His, his oven is sitting there. And I walk up to the guy, and this is lunch hour, and I said, how much do you make an hour? And he looked at me like I was crazy. I said, how much pizza do you make in an hour? How, what, how much money will you make selling pizzas? And he said, I forget what the figure was. He said, I'll double it if you will close the doors and give me one hour. And he looked at me and said, what, are you crazy? You know? I said, no, I need one hour of your oven. You know? oh and I went home, and it was funny, and I grabbed this thing, and I'm you know, bringing it down to Broadway, and people are looking at me and as, I'm, as I'm going through the street. You know? and, and I go into his place, and we shove it in the pizza oven. You know, and, it worked, it, and it worked. And it worked. It, it dried in one hour. Took so it out. Pizza, baby. What a great know? story. And I finished it and brought it in. So uh, it was... <laughs> It was fun. Um, yeah, who got cooked in the, uh, in then the that, that one was followed by the one above it, uh, which had to do with uh, medication for birth. And so I was, uh, I was getting a little better at sculpting by then, so I, uh, I did that one, which is actually a cast of a sculpture done in clay. Um, and what happened is uh, it was too expensive for them to photograph this. Mm -hmm. And so what they wanted me to do was take a photograph of the sculpture and paint on the photograph. And so that's what I ended up doing. That's why that one doesn't have anything on it. Um, uh, let's see what else. What, what's the uh, the runner up there? Um, and when I was in the sports, doing a lot of sports illustration, I did a series of posters on uh, on um, uh, track and field, and so that was one of them. Great colors. Yeah, it was, and it was, um, yeah, they they were fun. I mean, it was like really loose, and I would I would use the the washes, and everything was worked wet, and the the light areas of of let's say the head and like the light on his fist. This is done with Dr. Martin's aniline dyes, which are the same dyes that they use for uh, dyeing fabric. When, you know, and so it actually dyes the paper. It's different than watercolor. Mm -hmm. And to get the lights, you take Clorox, and you wash in the Clorox, and it bleaches out the white. So when it's wet, it gets a kind of a fuzzy little edge on it. Mm -hmm. And that's how that's done. Only you can't make any mistakes. So it was a little bit, um, uh, it became a little bit too, um, stressful because you know just not being able to make a mistake was too difficult. Um, the hands. The hands are part of uh, a magic book. Uh, you can see the, the, the books are right here. Okay. Uh, that was the one of the um, opening drawings, spread drawings, um, on a book called Now You See It, Now You Don't, Lessons in Sleight of Hand, which I did with a friend of mine who was a magician. It had 1,500 drawings this in it. This doesn't happen to be a New York magician, does it? Um, uh, he lived in New York at the time. Not Bill Brunel? No, no. 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 I, know, I met Bill. Yeah. I know Bill. Yeah. yeah. Um, I met him later on. Uh -huh. So um, Bill had some very good, Bill Tarr was a magician. He had some very good contacts at Random House. Um, and so we went up there and we proposed that magic was really in and we're going to do this book. And um, we convinced them. And they gave us a really good size advance. The, I was quite surprised that that happened. In fact, the next larger advance went to Norman Mailer for one of his books. You know, it was like, I, th I, I couldn't believe, I still don't believe that they did that, but they did. <laughs> and um, so we produced this book, which I wish I, could, I, wish I had it down here, but um, uh, it has become, it is still selling. It has sold, it's the largest selling magic book ever done. Really? And it has sold 160,000 copies so far. And what was the name of it again? So we uh, can tell us. Now you see it, now you don't. don't. Lessons in sleight of hand. Right. And um, I don't know what printing it's in, but it continues to sell on a regular basis. You know, Amazon dot, you know, Amazon Books, it's still selling it and, um, you know, so on. So it, it, was, it was fun using Bill's hands and it was fun to do the job. And now I know all about how, you know, magic how works. Happens. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I like this this real detailed uh, technical one over here. Well, this one this Vignettes. one is is actually not technical. 
Well, just the, the yeah, the, the pen and ink. Vignettes. Yeah, this was for the New York Daily News, the newspaper, when they opened a Brooklyn edition. They and they wanted to give a premium to anyone who would subscribe to the paper, and so this is a montage illustration of the most famous parts of Brooklyn. You know, the uh, Brooklyn Bridge, um, Brooklyn Heights, uh, the Academy of Music. Uh, the uh, Dutch Church in Flatbush, uh, um, Coney Island, um, Sheepshead Bay, the aquarium, you know, and so on, um, Grand Army Plaza and the museum and so on. And uh, I think they, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands they printed up and gave away, you know. Um, so that was, that was also, I, I, I have to admit nice. that almost everything that I do pretty much I enjoy. It's, it's just fun to do it. and, and uh, um, you know, uh, it's great to be able to say that. Well, uh, the one above it, I don't know if you can if you can catch that. It says ITT Telecom. Now that would be a typical technical illustration that I would do, in which um, the company, through my mailings, called me up and said we want you to do this poster, and they flew me down to um, North Carolina. They were in Raleigh, and um, I sat all day with an engineer to learn how this system worked. You know, and then I sat there with the engineer, and it was very important that I explained to him that I'm not an engineer, so I don't want to know numbers. I just want to know how does this get from here to there, and I did a drawing that that really it's quite accurate as to in the circuit in the little tiny chip where the signal comes in, how it gets interrogated, turned around, routed, and so on. Translates Tran to the av average person yeah. who doesn't want to know all those little number exactly. Details. So it basically shows uh, what how their, their digitizing equipment worked at that time. That was a, a number of years ago. But, um, and again, the satisfaction there is, is first in learning the subject, um, secondly, being able to translate it in a way that someone can understand, and then having the pleasure of doing it in a way that um, will be visually exciting. So, uh, and then the air? Those, those are part of the, the whole series that I do for, you know, for Flying Magazine. Um, and again, those are experiences of uh, a pilot in that particular airplane in Las Vegas, which is why it's so bright, um, who took off and, and had something wrong with his airplane and couldn't gain any altitude and ended up going over the hotels 15 feet above the neon, you know, mm -hmm. or this fellow who had some problem with all uh, oh, his instruments and so on. But it's always that kind of uh, uh, and situation. And those are watercolor. Those are pen and ink and watercolor. Pen and ink watercolor. Um, and the one below, to me, from here, it looks like a print. It's a drawing. It's in sepia ink, um, and it's again a technical drawing. But it and it shows the. Um, to me, that's more the Leonardo da Vinci. Yeah, I, I wish I had some of those up. They actually did look like Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, um, you know, uh, they were on toned paper. They were on a brown mm -hmm. paper with little white highlights and um, cross hatching and mm -hmm. handwritten, you know, kind of stuff. Uh, that has a slight feeling of it. Um, but it shows the, uh, a whole new bicycle design and how it worked and why it was better for your body. Um, so Another great one. So you have all these piles here. Oh, I'm just sloppy. This is all... That's, that's neat. <laughs> uh, these are all uh, the last few years' drawings from Golf Magazine. I now have uh, probably a thousand originals. Do you sell them? I would like to, but I haven't, I haven't figured out quite how to do it. Uh, when I use would anyone as have, a model, would you have a problem with the magazine? Do you? No, I own them. You own you know, them. I can't reproduce them. Okay. But um, I or rather I can't reproduce them as instruction drawings in another magazine, and I can't make a book out of them. Mm -hmm. But I can sell the originals, or you know, uh, I've been thinking of opening a website. That's why these are here. I actually went through. These are about five hundred of them, of the thousand, and. Um, what I'd like to do is open a website there where I'd be able to, say, select 100 of them, and then someone could access the website, and if they wanted a particular drawing about putting or um, uh, the driver or... I need or a present for my father in a few weeks. <laughs> He's a wonderful well, why don't golfer. You, why don't I'll you have to talk to you later. <laughs> okay. You know, and also, when I, do the, when I use a, a person at Fairfield as a model, mm -hmm. I give them the original. I mean, oh. that's, you know, so usually, and I'll sign it with a little inscription and, you know, so um, he would end up getting the original. Oh, that uh, would be neat. So that could be his birthday present. 
Oh, well, now I can't watch the show because you want to be a surprise. Oh, well, yeah. And over here on this other Can wall, you see the... I don't know if you'll be able to get to... Um, the golf club one. I love that. That's yeah, that... Um, now, was that for a magazine? That was something? for Golf Magazine as well. I was going to say, that would make the, a wonderful print. It, golf art is... is really yeah, no, I, I really have to think more about that in, in terms of... Um, uh, marketing that. I just haven't had the, um, I don't know what you call it, the, the energy, you know, just doing the work and wanting to sculpt and, uh, you know, so on. I just haven't had the, I need a, another person who would take that over and, you know, and do the marketing. Mm -hmm. But um, this was on the new technology of golf, the, the, the lowest mm -hmm. one. Then there was a series I did on Bobby Jones. Um, uh, I did one you know, with Bobby Jones and Hogan and mm -hmm. Sneed and, um, and the others that are up here are just, uh, that was also in the magazine. And then I've done a few golf books. And the ones that are on the left there are from those books. So I did a book uh, with, that one is called um, First Tee. It's a book for beginning golfers. And I've done a book for the PGA Tour. And another so book. you actually wrote the text? No, I, no. I just do the drawings. Did, okay. Um, do you sell those? Yeah. Okay. Sure. I love this, yeah. <laughs> so do you, you, you say you want to sculpt. Do you have some... Uh, Sculpture? Have, yeah, do you have yeah, anything that, you would like to show us? We could show that piece back there. Yeah. You want to turn around? We'll, uh, and we'll stroll to the back. We'll uh, maybe stop the camera so he can turn around. The front part of the studio, which you've carved out <laughs> a little place for you to do some artwork, some sculpture, Tell us about this piece that we're seeing. Okay. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I really, you know, I do want to sculpt. I mean, that's, that's really where my heart lies. And um, initially, when I got this space, I thought, all right, I'll just have this little area and do work here. Uh, but my desires and the um, scope of what I want to sculpt has gotten so much larger that uh, I ended up, I, I started this piece. It's not complete yet, but uh, will be. It's actually two pieces. Um, and I hadn't quite finished it when I started a third, which is five feet tall and four feet wide in my garage at home. Uh, subsequently, I realized I need a big space. And, and uh, we're in the process of converting a barn that we have into a sculpture studio, which will be two stories high with a mezzanine. And mm -hmm. um, it's about 25 by 30 feet. You know, and it's going to be just um, very inspiring to work there. Uh, but meanwhile, I've been, you know, working here, and, and um, what this, is this? Tell us well, what this would. this is a piece that I had done. Let's see, let me get over here. Actually, uh, it's a woman in ecstasy, is what it is, and it's done out of mesquite, uh, Mexican wood, which just happens to be very, very hard. And I did it many years ago, actually, and uh, in Mexico, um, and carved it with. Uh, I found this piece of wood lying in a garage uh, of a little pension where. Uh, we were staying, and the only tools that were available were a ball peen hammer and a straight chisel. And for three days, I just hacked away at this, and it was heaven. It really was great. Uh, subsequently, it would be in the it was in the living room among the plants, and I thought, well, gee, it would make a great fountain. And so first, I had a, uh, with the help of Dale Devoki at, at MUM, um, he helped me make a mold, and we did a casting of it, so that I have a casting in um, in, in a uh, uh, polyresin, uh, also do some casts in cement, and what will happen in the cast, the water will come out here and flow down and over the sides. And I thought, well, what would be better than to have a fountain for it as well? And I found this tree trunk, and this is actually the tree trunk turned over. These shapes are the roots, where the roots were. Now, and, did you get that locally? Uh, yeah, it was or? in uh, someone's backyard, on, uh, front yard in sto on Stone, uh, West Stone. And I went in and said, hey, um, you know, do you need that thing? You know? <laughs> oh, if you can get it out of you here, it's you yours. Need that <laughs> you don't have it. And you know, Fairfield Lumber sent, uh, I had him send over a forklift. And you know, getting it up here was something else. You know? But um, it's almost finished. And um, I'll probably wait until the new studio is done and move it there and finish it there. I, I, you know, um, and this will also be um, made into a, I'll have a mold, I'll make a mold and make a, um, probably a cement, terracotta cement uh, cast of it. And then if people want to buy fountains, 
they'll have this. You know. Great. Uh, the original will probably not. Um, I probably can make it waterproof enough that it would hold water, and uh, although I wouldn't have this, would I would probably just raise up so the water just comes right here. But uh, this is one of, you know, one that I'm working on. I have the one at home, uh, which is, um, as I said, a, a huge tree trunk. And um, if anyone has any tree trunks they want uh, removed, you know, uh, I'm looking for good, good wood. <laughs> is there a certain wood, wood that you're looking for? Is, um, is oak too oak, hard? Oak is okay. I'm, the one I'm working on now is, uh, I think it's butternut, actually. Uh, but, you know, like black walnut is great if you can find it. it, it uh, the smoother grains are best. Oak isn't bad. Okay. Uh, maple is, is okay. Um, cherry would be wonderful. Um, but uh, no, I'm actually, uh, once, this, once the new studio is done, then I'll have a place to store the wood because uh, you really have to let it dry and, mm -hmm. and um, uh, dry properly. Um, so we'll see. And uh, maybe in another year you can come back and, and um, you know, in the new digs, you know, the new space. Like another story. Yeah, and we'll see what, uh, what has happened uh, in the interim. Uh, right. Hopefully there'll be a lot of sculpture. So. Well, thank you, Barry, for okay. uh, sharing the afternoon with us and with our community and opening another door. It's a very interesting person um, and seeing what he does right here in Fairfield. Thanks a lot, Barry. It and was thank really you. wonderful and fascinating and and uh, just think of all the people that you're, you're giving them their 15 minutes of fame by being in the uh, golf magazine. I love um. it. I'm, I'm hoping maybe next year of actually having um, a show of all the golf drawings. I mean, of course, no one could buy them, you know, buy it, but just as a kind of, um, uh -huh. you know, for the golfing community. Absolutely. I'll talk to you, know. you about that later, too. Okay. You know, That's there's something great for the Art Association yeah. to promote. Well, there has to be at least, I've, I've done at least 40, you know, so far. And it, I, uh, every month or every other month, I do another one. You know, so and sometimes more. In uh, uh, some issues, I've had more than one person from, you know, from the magazine, yeah, uh, from the, from Fairfield. Mm -hmm. Well, that's so. great. Thanks a lot, Barry. It You're was welcome. really a lot of fun, and I hope we all en you enjoyed this too.